right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. Today, I'm delighted to be joined from London in the UK by Yanis Ioannou. How are you doing, Yanis? Great, thanks for having me, John. How are you? Doing great. And uh, and uh, um, Yanis is a professor and advisor, global influencer, keynote speaker on sustainability, leadership, corporate responsibility, uh, and you are based at the London Business School. And so um, we're going to talk today about sustainability and corporate responsibility. Um, one thing that was interesting, um, uh, Yanis, like I was I was looking at um, some of um, your your talks before, and. Let's let's start on the concept of sustainability because to most people sustainability mean they they perceive to mean you know green initiatives like you know so corporate corporate sustainability initiatives is like you know donating money to planting trees <laughs> but that's but it's so much more than that correct absolutely so sustainability in a business context has to do with the integration of both environmental and social issues at the core of the business at the core of the business model and the strategy not the periphery not the friday afternoon activities so in short it's about you know managing beyond a narrowly defined and often short-sighted economic context so that a business accounts for the broader social and environmental domain in which it finds itself in yeah, so so let's uh, let's dive a little deeper into that. So, I mean, some people uh, listening to this may say, "Okay, that sounds great for for big corporations, you know, with lots of money and resources." But what about medium and smaller businesses? I think that's particularly important for them because. Um, sustainability is a disruption for business, and as with every disruption, what happens? Large businesses have the um, challenge of adapting, but most of the change comes from new entrepreneurial ventures. Look at Tesla, Beyond Food, Impossible, sorry, Beyond Meat, Impossible Foods. So I think sustainability and all the environmental and social challenges that come with it provide a whole range of amazing opportunities for new startups to come in and solve the world's problems while being able to scale up very efficiently, effectively and profitably. So I think the right way of looking at this is as a huge growth opportunity. Mm -hmm. And what about for, for existing businesses uh, uh, and ones that you've, you've worked with or advised? How have you seen some of them adopt some initiatives that actually impact their business in a positive way? Right. So one thing to keep in mind here, John, is that it is extremely difficult. The transitions through a disruption are particularly difficult. And when we talk about sustainability in particular, companies are lacking the necessary skills, knowledge and experience to manage these social environmental challenges. So you see a whole diversity of responses. There's companies that first say, well, I'll just do what the law requires me to do. But then there's a group of companies that move beyond what the law requires. So for instance, some of them adopt the easy, the low-hanging fruit, for instance, eco-efficiency measures, you can think about water management, waste management, and so on. Then once they realize that that at the very least has a positive impact on the bottom line because it's efficiency, right? They move on to the next stage, which is about integrating into their products and services and the core of the strategy. For instance, think about the automobile industry. First, it might have been about reducing the, the carbon emissions of fossil fuel engines, but then it was about hybrid cars. Increasingly, it's about electric cars and so on. So changing the very nature of the product and service. And then there's the last stage, which are the Unilevers of the world, where you move beyond the walls of your own business. You look at your supply chain and you diffuse the responsibility. You talk about bigger issues. And to keep about with the example of the automobile industry, it's about not only electric cars, but now discussing the future of mobility, perhaps in the context of sustainable cities, for instance. So you go into advocating and into sort of driving the entire industry with you. So we've seen a whole range of responses, but it seems that the distribution is moving in the right direction. More and more companies are not only discovering the cost efficiencies, but are willing to experiment, change their products to meet the end of the day, these demands and expectations in this very new and emerging uh, competitive landscape. 
Yeah, and it's interesting there what you said about cost savings because um, I, I I would I would hazard that there's a, a lot of people would instinctively think okay if we if we have to move to sustainability and all of that kind of stuff that it's going to cost the company money as opposed to save it money. Well, John, well there's certainly uh, low hanging fruit in the in the form of cost savings, but let's be honest, there is no uh, free strategy. No strategy comes without mm -hmm. a cost, right? I mean, would you consider R&D investments in the pharmaceutical industry as a cost or, some, or as an investment? So my argument is that if you actually get sustainability right for your industry, these are investments. And then we do have the evidence that if you do it right, then it does lead to better businesses, to more thriving businesses in the long run. But the key there is to understand that, you know what? Everything about management is about trade-offs. How much mm -hmm. a marketing budget would I have versus how many wa how much wages I'm going to pay, right? So there's always a trade-off. That's not the issue. The issue is how do you resolve that trade-off? And that's where uh, that's where the, the best of leaders and the best of companies distinguish themselves in the sustainability space as well. Yeah, no, no, that, absolutely. It's um, it's it's very interesting. Um, and I guess the other thing is uh, what you touched upon there a moment ago is that idea of pushing out to your partners, your supply chain, everybody. So ultimately, if, if, if this is to succeed, you, you do need to kind of go to that model of kind of co-opting those around you. Well, I think not only if we are to succeed as a business, but if we are to succeed as a global society in meeting these challenges, we absolutely have to. That's why, in my view, the largest of companies that have deep international, global, interconnected supply chains have a higher burden of responsibility. Because if, for instance, uh, Unilever or Procter & Gamble or Nestle and so on actually are able to diffuse the responsibility through the thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of partners that they have in their supply chains, then we can talk about um, impact at scale, transformation at scale, and finally, you know, move the needle on some of the world's biggest challenges. So in that respect, you know, we, we, we've seen that a lot of the times. So we've seen that in terms of human rights standards, environmental standards, health and safety standards, large companies in particular are demanding that their supply chain partners follow those standards or they drop them which is or, or they may or, or they drop them if they don't make a net zero commitment for instance so i think that is one way through which you can work with your supply chain and and in so doing amplify the impact that you can have uh, as a business and in terms of amplifying the um the sense of responsibility outside your the the walls of your own business Mm -hmm. And then, um, so and then, there's obviously a big challenge for some of these companies, especially these large global multinational companies, is that there can be large parts of their supply chain that are are, are situated in in countries or regions or places that uh, that maybe you know don't subscribe to this point of view. Absolutely, and and this is becomes particularly important when we start talking about um, uh, social issues or human rights issues. But mm -hmm. I would I would say that you know the the system that is maturing enough that we have had a good discussion, for instance, about. What happens when there are institutional voids? In other words, weak governments, weak police enforcement, and so on. Where do the responsibilities of, of government end and where does the responsibility of business start? So there are a lot of human rights conventions and so on in terms of helping businesses, especially in contested industries, right? Mining, for instance, and how you mm -hmm. deal with illegal miners that invade your mines in, in areas where there's no police, for example. Right. So I think uh, we do slowly but steadily. It is certainly not as advanced as our understanding of environmental issues. But I think that that's that's also a domain, John, that it's not just a business problem. Right. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a problem of governance. And it's a, sometimes it's, it's a problem of global governance. Right? That's why I think in the grand scheme of things, of course, businesses can lead the way. But at the end of the day, we will need more global, multidimensional collaborations between companies, between governments, and a lot of the times between NGOs and local community and society in order to resolve these issues. Nobody's an extra because the challenges are simply too complex and too large. Yeah, no, I, I agree. It's, a, it, it, it's an interesting challenge ahead um, for sure, because, I mean, as I said today, you, you'll see a lot of, if you look through most multinationals, uh, supply chains you will see there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, 
diversity, shall we say, in in approaches to to these things. Um, the other thing that you that you um, that you mentioned there about um, so this is big corporations and big multinational corporations, but obviously at a at a smaller and local level, these are things that perhaps, as you mentioned earlier, perhaps these are somewhat easier to do if your maybe your supply chain of a small or local business is a lot more contained and a lot more a lot easier to influence. I think that is the the general idea in the sense that the smaller organizations might be more agile, more flexible. And what is very important to keep in mind here is that at the heart of sustainability, in my view, lie relationships. In other words, mm -hmm. with your suppliers, with your customers, with local community, those relationships clearly are easier to cultivate, to deepen and to establish when we're talking about smaller numbers. And that's very important because rather than looking at your stakeholders in a transactional sort of way, if you do look at them as relationships, then those relationships in the long run become intangible assets. And that's where you create a lot of benefits for the business, whether it's reputational, whether it's in, in terms of looking at the business as an open system, in which case you get more timely, more accurate, more trustworthy information. Well, if you have more accurate, timely and trustworthy information, that means you have a high, higher quality of decision making. So I think all of those are, uh, I mean, I don't want to make the rosy picture. Of course, sure. it's a matter of resources, right? But small companies have a resource constraint for any decision that they make. It's not that there's anything specific about sustainability decisions. They have lower, lower R&D budgets. They have lower marketing budgets, right? Question is, given the limited resources, how you make the best of decisions to maximize your impact? And I think even at that level, at that size, if you like, investing in your relationships and building those intangible assets is beneficial in the long run. Yeah, no, I, I I couldn't agree more, and I think that there is a great advantage there for small business in the in the uh, because they can be more nimble and they can um, build these relationships over time. Um, just on the corporate uh, res social responsibility uh, side, obviously there's a lot of there's a lot of talk about this, and there's people who do it in different ways, and but there seems to be, I mean, there is a perception in some areas that. You know, there's some lip service paid to this, and it tends to be it goes towards what it what's the what's the um, issue du jour, and that's what the right. you know the companies will will latch on to, and sometimes it seems that it's that it's it's quite superficial and almost uh, almost um, how can I say this almost uh, it's almost like taking advantage of this yeah or taking advantage of a situation. Yeah. So I think you're absolutely right. And that's a big problem, right? That's, in other words, companies uh, exaggerating what they do or outright lying sometimes, greenwashing or sometimes called rainbow washing, because sometimes people do that for the sustainable mm -hmm. development goals and so on. But I am encouraged, to be honest, because I do think that as civil society, we are developing the mechanisms to hold them accountable. And let me give you an example. We've heard a lot in the asset management industry, for example, BlackRock comes out and said, you know, it says I support climate change um, uh, action and so on. And then if you look at their voting record on climate change resolutions, it's rather poor. But who looked at that? It's an NGO, for instance, based here in the UK called Share Action, that was actually that actually published a ranking of asset managers according to how they voted. So I'm very optimistic in the sense that these sort of demands for accountability, especially after public declarations have been made, are going to make a huge difference going forward. And it's not just civil society. Recently in the US, the SEC announced a task force in order to fight greenwashing. Similar um, provisions are in the European Union, given the latest disclosure regulations. So I think that society and regulators are aware of these efforts. And let's not forget that, especially on the investment side, there's much more increasing sophistication. So um, investors are investing a lot in AI and big data technologies to, to really uh, gather all the information around the company. So it's becoming more and more difficult. It's not that you're going to write a nice story in your sustainability. That that might fool a human is not going to fool the algorithm right because the algorithm is going to look for numbers for instance um so so that's in that sense i think we're moving in the right direction and i think the whole discussion about arriving at the reporting standards that can also be mandating is certainly going to help you yeah, know absolutely and I, and i think because i think from a lot of from a layperson's point of view i mean sometimes they see 
some of these large companies who have who make who make great statements and all of this but they have if you look at their supply chain they are they have questionable partners with human rights uh, issues right. and and uh, and uh, you know labor that's uh, you know young labor that's used in 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 oppressive ways and stuff like that so i think that's that's i think that from an outside point of view that's i think where a lot of people struggle with this because they see companies saying one thing but then they know that they're actually you know supporting something that's almost the opposite yeah, that's a, that's a challenge for companies themselves. I mean, I'm not going to justify mm -hmm. bad or foul behavior by sure. companies, but uh, let's assume a fictitious company give the CEO the best of intentions. No CEO has a magic wand that says the 30,000 people that work for my company will automatically all of them tomorrow, you know, become, you know, work with sustainability principles in mind and change. It's like, it's like driving a huge tanker, right? From the time you, you start turning the wheel, it, it will take time for the whole tanker to change. Yes, I mean, there, there are CEOs and top executives that are very genuine in their intentions, but organizations are communities. There are multiple people in them. There is process, structure, hierarchy, bureaucracy, all of those issues that in general, for instance, make established organizations less innovative, less flexible. So if you're trying to sort of cascade the sustainability commitment through the organization from the top down, it is inevitably going to take time. There are going to be steps back, right? Because there might always be mm -hmm. bad apples or people that are ideologically driven or people that as always might just resist change because a transformation towards sustainability is a very fundamental change for the organization. So as I always say, it is of course important to understand the stage at which a company is today, but in my view, it's perhaps even more important to be able to evaluate the trajectory. Are they moving in the right direction with the right speed and the right magnitude of change? So in other words, evaluate their flexibility to move towards a more sustainable business model. Again, without justifying bad behavior, of course, but um, you know, looking at the issue a bit more dynamically rather than how it companies today only. Yeah, and, and I think part of the issue too, Yanis, is that uh, perhaps it's, perhaps like what you've done today is you have explained things on a, on a deeper level, I think, than most people would would normally have heard it. And I think that's part of the problem is that these these uh, terms are thrown out or, or adopt uh, but they're not ex they're not explained how this is actually beneficial it does actually sometimes it does come off as just ideological or as i said just the initiative du jour as opposed to getting down into explaining the actual benefits and how this might work in the long run yeah, absolutely. And I, that's to some extent understandable because this is what I would call a nascent field. It's not that the companies or anybody for that matter in, in the business world have been doing this for ages and this is a mature field and we have uh, very precise definitions about the concepts that we use. Actually, if you think about in terms of evidence, empirical, empirically driven research, it's a phenomenon of the last 10, 15 years perhaps while we, we were able to gather this information, extract general trends and principles, and that's what allowed us to go so deeply into this. So I do expect that the fog will settle at some point, John. But let me let me be clear, though, that I do, despite some pathologies like greenwashing and box ticking and so on, I do think the proliferation of frameworks of different concepts and different theories, it's actually a good sign. It only tells us how important these issues are, how that, that the fact that they're going to stay with us in the long run, and the fact that many people around the world, whether academics or practitioners or investors and so on, are actually deeply engaging and try to understand these issues uh, with, uh, with the ultimate objective of really trying to address some of the world's biggest challenges. So for me, at least for, for the most part, I'm willing to, to, to uh, consider all of this sort of commotion in this field as a race to the top, as, 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 a good, as progress. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm optimistic in that respect. Yeah, but fan, uh, great. And and just one last question then. Um, what do you what are your predictions for the near and medium term future? Where do you see all of this going? I think there's going to be a couple of big uh, areas of development. First of all, I think in general, the asset management industry and pension funds, in other words, the finance function is going to continue on this trajectory and deepen this trajectory in terms of 
really trying to allocate the world's huge uh, amounts of capital into more sustainable um, enterprises. I, I do expect that trend to go beyond just public equities and, and um, across asset classes. Um, related to that, I think we're going to see much more enhanced efforts by governments and institutions in general to arrive at of common reporting standards so that we eventually all speak the same language. And I think the last component I would add is that I expect civil society to continue being active, to become, to, to continue becoming more sophisticated in terms of how we engage with companies. For instance, think about NGOs. Many years ago, they would protest and pick it. Now, what do they do? They buy shares and they show at companies annual general meetings, right? And they file resolutions and, and perhaps they're more effective that way, right? So I think that sophistication uh, of engagement and in general civil society pressures are, on companies are going to intensify. So as a result of those three trends, and of course, in addition to the science uh, that, that kind of characterizes not only environmental, but increasingly socially, issues. I do think that this trend is going to uh, accelerate and, and hopefully we're going to see some, uh, some, uh, some results soon. Although, you know, there are days where we do take important steps backwards, but I think uh, in the long term, we should, I hope, uh, ho I certainly hope that we are moving in the right direction. <laughs> yeah, listen, thanks so much, Yanis. Uh, it's been fascinating. All of Yanis' information will be below this video. Um, but before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about yourself. So I was born and raised in Cyprus. I left after uh, high school to study 10 years in the US and I've been here 12 years in the UK. I love doing this kind of work, not only as a professional, not only as an academic, but I do profoundly think that we need to solve these problems. And that's what makes me get out of bed in the morning and start working on those issues. And uh, in that respect, John, thank you so much for giving me the chance to share my passion, if you like, on these issues with, uh, with your audience. It's been a true pleasure. Yeah, listen, thank you. The pleasure has been all ours and your, your passion absolutely shines through. So thank you. Um, again, as I said, all of Yanis's information will be below. I would, uh, I would uh, encourage you to check it out. It's got a lot of great videos with some interesting um, information. Uh, my name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine, Pipeline CRM. See you all for another interview soon. Thank you. <laughs>